Ever since Malcolm Gladwell popularized the so-called 10,000 hour rule in 2008, people have been arguing over how many practice hours it really takes for someone to reach expert levels of performance. As a result, nearly everyone missed the point of the research that Gladwell was drawing from. That research, published back in 1993, was far more focused on how elite performers achieve their greatness, not so much on how long it takes. Lucky for us, that research produced some very useful results. It showed that the main thing that separates champions from the rest of us is a habit of deliberate practice. Hours count, of course, but they don't count nearly as much as how you spend them. Too often, what most of us call practice is just engaging in the activity in question. We assume, for instance, that putting in a lot of hours on the basketball court will prep us for the NBA, and that putting in hours playing the guitar will turn us into shredders. And while it's true that some practice is better than no practice, there's an enormous difference between practicing deliberately and simply logging hours. Deliberate practice means working on skills that are a little above your current level of ability, instead of simply rehearsing the skills that you're already good at. It also means identifying your weak areas and targeting them during your practice time. Not many people do that. Consider this. There are undoubtedly thousands of basketball players who, by the age of 20, had put in just as many on-court hours as Michael Jordan or LeBron James had uh, by the time they were 20. But those thousands of other guys didn't become basketball legends. Why not? Because those thousands of other guys spent most of their time playing the game, whereas Jordan, James, and the other NBA elites spent a much larger portion of their time targeting their weak areas, you know, until they no longer had any. When I first stumbled onto this research, it really resonated with me because over the course of my life, I have wasted a lot of valuable practice time not practicing. And I'm not even talking about the time I wasted watching TV. Back when I was just a little musician, I spent most of my so-called practice time playing through a handful of Beatles songs over and over. I called that practicing, but what I was really doing was rehearsing material I already knew. Truth be told, I was just daydreaming playing easy and familiar pop tunes while imagining myself performing in front of an adoring audience. None of the time I spent doing that was making me a better musician. So don't make my mistake. Know these terms and start using them correctly. Practice is systematically attempting to perform a skill that you're not currently good at. Rehearsal is performing a skill you've already mastered. Practice is what you do to get better. Rehearsal is what you do to make sure you've memorized material for a live performance. The only time it's acceptable to spend more time rehearsing than practicing is when you've got a performance coming up in the very near future. Well, do you, punk? If you intend to level up as a musician, or as a basketball player, or a hula dancer, or anything else, you need to arrange your practice schedule so that you're spending way more of your time practicing deliberately than you're spending rehearsing what's already comfortable and familiar. I'm about to show you the precise steps to follow in order to get the most out of your practice time. But before I get to those steps, here are some general but very important principles of effective practice. And stick around to the end too, because I'm going to demonstrate those principles and steps on the guitar and the piano. I'll be making lots of mistakes. It'll be loads of fun. Principle one, practice with a metronome or a rhythm track more often than not. If music has a useful definition, it is sounds organized in time. Unfortunately, for every 10 musicians I see working on their sound, I only see one or two seriously working on their timing. And that's crazy. You wouldn't call yourself a painter if you just mixed paints and enjoyed gazing at the pretty colors all day, right? No, because you're not a painter until you start organizing those colors on a surface just like you're not a sculptor until you start organizing material into shapes. So now think about how many hours most guitarists spend turning knobs on their amps and adjusting sliders on their pedals to get their tone just right, versus how many hours they spend on skills related to rhythm. If that's you, get your head out of your amp. If you're not constantly reinforcing your sense of tempo with a metronome or a rhythm track, you're gonna suck in live performances. You'll develop the habit of changing tempo when it's not called for, without realizing it, you'll be slowing down when you reach challenging passages, and then speeding up again in familiar sections. Do that and you're not gonna be able to keep time with other musicians. And that means they're not gonna let you play in their reindeer games. Besides, a metronome is a great way to keep track of your progress. You don't have to use it all the time, but way more often than not. 
Principle two, train yourself to play through your mistakes. Our natural tendency when we screw up is to start and our natural tendency when we screw up is to stop and start over. A lot of us even stop, apologize, and then start over. That's a disastrous habit. If you do it in practice or during your lessons, you'll do it automatically during performances, and you must never do that during performances. Audiences will tolerate and even fail to notice the occasional missed note or forgotten lyric. But stopping a piece of music or even just breaking the rhythm for a beat is jaw-droppingly obvious and utterly cringeworthy. Audiences hate it, most likely because they can't pretend they didn't hear it. It's like an audible fart in an elevator. It has to be acknowledged. So whenever you practice or take a lesson, force yourself to play through your mistakes until doing that becomes your habit. Principle three, remember that practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Whatever you do repeatedly, whether it's good or bad, gets ingrained as habit. Therefore, anytime you find yourself making the same or similar mistake during practice, stop and identify the problem. Then begin working carefully on that section of the piece or that particular technique in isolation at a much slower tempo. Once you're able to play it consistently without mistakes, slowly ramp your way back up to performance speed. If you don't correct your mistakes early, they'll be yours for life. Parenthetical insert. You may have noticed what looks like a contradiction. In principle two, I'm telling you to play through your mistakes, while in principle three, I'm telling you to stop and fix your mistakes. Just to be clear and head off all the trolls who will try to make themselves feel smart in the comment section, I'm telling you that when you make a mistake in practice, you should make a mental note of it. Then play to the end of the passage that you're working on, then stop, return to the trouble spot, and analyze the problem. End parenthesis. Principle four, keep records of your progress, preferably videos. Learning any new skill is a race between satisfaction and frustration. When you don't feel like you're making progress at something, you'll get discouraged and spend less time practicing. That leads to even less progress and more discouragement, which leads to less practicing and it goes on, spiraling into a vicious cycle. But the opposite is also true. Progress begets progress. Reaching a goal gives you the reward of satisfaction, also known as the dopamine hit, which encourages more practice, which brings more satisfaction, etc., etc., in what's called a virtuous cycle. The only catch is, with music, it's often very hard to appreciate your own progress because the changes are usually slow and incremental. Keeping records is often the only way to clearly see that you're advancing. If you don't keep records, then you're denying yourself those little rushes of gratification that will keep you engaged and moving forward. Athletes get great satisfaction from looking back at their old personal best to see how far they've come. Likewise, I enjoy looking back over my notes and seeing that I used to crash on a particular piano solo at 100 beats per minute, and now I breeze through it at 180. It's like going back to the beginner slope after you've been an intermediate skier for a while. That bunny slope used to terrify you, and now it looks as level as a pool table. That's deeply gratifying to a skier, so make sure you're reaping the same gratification as a musician by tracking your progress. Video is the best way to do this. For one thing, your phone is probably always handy. Just make sure that you're date stamping your recordings. Another reason video is best is because it will give you brutally honest feedback about the things you can't see when you're practicing, like your posture and your technique. Video also gives you feedback about the things you can't hear. That's right, you usually can't hear yourself accurately during a good practice session because you're concentrating so hard on too many things at once. But during video playback, you'll not only hear missed notes, you'll also hear all those guitar strings that are buzzing because of your clumsy fingering, along with the ones that are still ringing out because you failed to mute them. Or you'll notice those piano notes that are bleeding into each other because you're not fully releasing the sustain pedal. You may even catch yourself grunting or wincing in unflattering ways during difficult passages, and you'll miss all of that stuff if you don't record yourself. And remember principle three, practice makes permanent. Video will help you catch your mistakes and silly faces before you commit them all to muscle memory. Principle five, less is more. You know how it is. You finally find some time to sit down to practice and that's when Commissioner Gordon sends up the bat signal. It's always something, right? Unless you're highly self-disciplined, and most people aren't, you're gonna find that reasons to skip practice abound. There's always something that seems more pressing. 
Well, if you're serious about leveling up as a musician, you have to prioritize at least some practice time every day. So I recommend committing yourself to short sessions. I've known people who say it's not worth picking up their instrument unless they have at least an hour of practice time available. And most of them are not very good musicians. They rarely practice because they've given themselves a monumental obstacle to overcome. So instead of that, tell yourself that you're going to give it 10 or 15 minutes every day, and then it won't seem so scary to pick up your instrument. You can always go longer when you have the time or the inspiration, but at least give yourself the best chance you can of getting in a little practice every day. In addition, there's a lot of scientific evidence that your brain continues to process things even when you don't think you're paying attention to them. And that's especially true for things that you concentrate on frequently. If you practice daily and deliberately, even in short bursts, you're letting your brain know that you wanted to keep working on music even when you're not physically practicing. Do that and you'll start having more and more of those magical experiences where you can suddenly play something that was giving you fits just yesterday. Your brain has an autopilot feature and you can engage it by focusing on music for at least a few minutes every day. Principle six, start each practice session with your most challenging material. Eat your veggies first. Treat yourself to dessert afterwards if you have time. Most people start with the easy stuff, telling themselves it's a good way to warm up. That's bullshit. Do it that way and you'll end up wasting your day's allotment of practice time rehearsing instead of practicing. If you truly want to level up, start with the hard stuff, even if you only work on it for five minutes. That way, if your practice time gets cut short for some reason, you will have spent what little time you had that day making forward progress instead of running in place. When I'm working on something that's especially challenging, I go at it twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening, but only for about 10 minutes at a shot. Sometimes life gets in the way, and that's all the time I'll get for music that day. On other days, I'll do quite a bit more practicing on top of that, maybe even some rehearsing, but I'll always begin with that five or 10 minutes on the most challenging material. The trick is to not bang your head so hard against the tough stuff that you don't wanna do it anymore. But at the same time, you need to work on it frequently enough that you're seeing progress. You've gotta keep that virtual cycle spinning. Principle seven, last one, I promise. Turn off the effects when you're practicing. Nothing hides sloppy technique like growling distortion, spacey delay, and heavy washes of reverb. Use those effects as much and as often as you want during rehearsals and performances, but shut them off during practice. That even goes for the sustain pedal on pianos. Lift that foot from time to time and play through those challenging passages without sustain, even if sustain is called for in the music. You will be shocked at how many bad notes have been hiding there all along under the wash of good ones. What's even more likely is that you'll realize that you're not even playing some notes. In particularly fast passages, it's easy to accidentally skim over some of the piano keys so rapidly that the note doesn't even sound. And that's something you won't catch if you're flooring the sustain pedal. Okay, let's get to the specific steps now. Don't panic, this list is shorter and simpler than the principles. Step one, pick a piece of music that you really want to learn but that's currently a little out of reach. In this way, you're giving yourself a task that's difficult enough to take you to a higher level, but one that you're strongly motivated to achieve. This is where a lot of students fail their teachers. You heard that right. This is where students fail their teachers. The teacher asks, what songs would you like to learn? And the student looks down at his shoes and shrugs. So the teacher ends up choosing something and it's usually out of a practice book. I'm sorry, but I don't know anyone who was inspired to put in extra practice hours so that he could learn how to play the Volga Boatman or hand and finger exercise number 12. So quit shrugging and choose something that you're eager to learn, you moron. Step two, break the complex task into smaller, easier tasks. That piano intro to say locomotive breath is rather daunting taken as a whole, but you have to remember that it's still just a string of notes that can be divided into small playable chunks. Even if you have to break a piece down into individual measures and work on just one measure a week, you'll eventually be playing the whole thing. The great thing about step two is that good teachers and good YouTube tutorials will take care of this for you. <coughs> In other words, they'll break up the piece of music that you've chosen into its most sensible segments and then we'll teach them that way. Step three, gamify your practice sessions. Once you can play a rough version of the segment you're working on, 
gamify it by turning it into a series of challenges. The easiest way to gamify your music practice is with a metronome challenge. One of which is where you keep pushing yourself to play the same segment of music at faster and faster tempos without collapsing into mistakes. The half speed metronome challenge is also extremely useful and underutilized. And yes, it's exactly what the name suggests. It's playing something musically and expressively at half of its intended speed. And that's no picnic. It's well worth doing. It may also be one of the best ways to commit a piece to memory. Yet another way to gamify your practice is to play passages with your eyes closed. I'll demonstrate each of these challenges later in this video. Step four, after mastering the smaller tasks through gamification, start stitching the segments together. A lot of people ignore this step. And then when they play the piece all the way through, they play a segment, stop, think, reposition their hands, play the next segment, stop, think, and so on. So let's say that you've mastered measures one through four of your favorite song as one segment, and then you master measures five through seven as a separate segment. Your next step isn't to start learning measure eight. It's to master measures three through six. That's how to work your way through a piece of music. FYI, segments should be meaningful phrases of music, not a random collection of measures. Step five, celebrate that you've leveled up as a musician. Treat yourself to a beer, treat yourself to a new set of guitar strings, treat yourself to a baby grand piano. How you reward yourself is up to you. But once you've sobered up, put on those new guitar strings and stolen a grand piano, go back to step one, select a slightly more challenging task, start over. Before I pick up an instrument to show you how this works in music, let me demonstrate that these steps work for anything you want to get better at. Back in the 90s, my best friend and I got into rollerblading. Don't judge me, it was big back then. My buddy and I didn't know the term deliberate practice at the time, but we were both public school teachers, and so we knew how to teach and how to learn. As a result, we ended up using the same steps that I just listed. It looked like this. Step one, rollerblading is inherently fun, so motivation wasn't a problem at all. But since my buddy and I wanted to be able to do more than cruise around parking lots, we decided to proceed as if we were learning to skate for the purpose of playing street hockey. Whether or not we ever actually played street hockey one day was beside the point. We just set that as our motivating goal. Hockey looks like a lot of fun, and it was certainly way above our level of ability. That's what step one is all about. Step two, we divided the overall activity of inline skating into separate skills that hockey players would need, such as sudden stops and tight turns. And then we started working on those skills in isolation. Step three, we bought a bunch of little orange cones and used them to gamify our practice sessions. The word gamify didn't exist back then, but the concept is hardly new. We created obstacle courses that demanded either sudden stops or tight turns in isolation. Then we'd compete to run the courses accurately. Once we could do that, we'd run each course for faster and faster times. Then we'd try to do it on one foot. Then we'd try to do it blindfolded. Okay, I made that up. We never skated blindfolded. Anyway, once a course started getting easy, we'd set up a harder one. Step four. Next, we used the cones to create courses that required stops and turns in combination, thus stitching together our new skills. Before we even realized what had happened, we were suddenly aware that we could stop and turn on a dime. If we had spent the same number of hours just cruising around the parking lot that we spent engaging in those challenges, we'd have made little to no progress for the same investment of time. That's what makes deliberate practice so powerful. Step five, we rewarded ourselves by buying hockey sticks. Then we went back to step one. For our next challenge, we chose 180 degree turns. After that, we started working on shooting goals. Then we went pro. Okay, enough of that. Meet me over at the piano. By now you should be completely sold on the idea of deliberate practice. These skills can be applied to any musical instrument and frankly, to any skill whatsoever. Right now though, I'm just gonna show you a few ways that they can be applied to the piano. For step one, I need a task that's challenging, but also highly motivating. Well, there's a set of fast piano runs in an old Billy Joel song called Scenes from an Italian Restaurant that have haunted me since I first heard the song back in the 70s. I was just a little pianist back then. Pianist. So what Billy did in that song looked like magic to me, like something I'd never be able to do myself. So I've decided to test that hypothesis against the power of deliberate practice. Step two is about dividing the task into small manageable chunks. In my opinion, 
The guru on all things Billy Joel these days is a YouTuber named Steve Lundgren. I'm pretty sure he's trying to create a set of tutorials for every song in Billy's catalog. Steve's not only a great performer, he's an exceptional teacher. And he breaks down each of Billy's songs into small, achievable chunks. First, he splits the songs into meaningful sections. Then he splits those sections into smaller sections and teaches them one hand at a time. Step three is gamification. After memorizing the runs well enough that I didn't need Steve's video anymore, I gamified my practice with a metronome challenge. Here's what the runs sound like at 120 beats per minute. So 120 beats per minute is a comfortable speed. I've been working up to it for a couple of weeks. My comfort zone speed was 100 beats per minute a couple of days ago, 90 beats per minute a few days before that. Uh, by the way, note that I'm keeping my foot off the sustain pedal now. That's principle seven. Let's try it now at 130 beats per minute. So that's what I call white knuckle driving. I was able to stay in my lane, but I had to concentrate and keep both hands on the wheel in order to do so. Let's try 140 beats per minute. So now I'm scraping the guardrails. I'm making mistakes, but they're small enough that most people, most casual listeners anyway, won't notice. Notice, however, that I'm playing through them as if they didn't happen. That's principle two, remember? By the way, another great reason to play through mistakes is that you'll learn ways to play it off and recover, fake your way through it. You'll catch pros doing this occasionally, and I believe I've even seen Billy Joel do it in, uh, while playing this very passage that I'm working on now. Take a look at this clip and let me know in the comment section if you think he hit the guardrails and then swapped a uh, glissando for the second part of his uh, piano runs. Tough call, right? Anyway, let's push the tempo up to 150 beats per minute. Okay, at this point, I'm sliding off the road and hitting some pedestrians. I'm making noticeable mistakes. I'm still playing through them, though, as if they didn't happen. Let's go to 160. Okay, now the wheels are coming off. I'm still gonna go a little faster though, and I'll tell you why in a second. Okay, since I don't want my mistakes to become habits, I'm not gonna spend any more time pushing past the point where I'm in control but it's well worth doing that from time to time. Here are three things that I learned just now from going past my comfort zone. First, look what happens when I go back to 130 beats per minute. That was where I was white knuckling just a few minutes ago. I won't go so far as to say that it now feels like I'm playing in slow motion, but it feels a lot slower than it did before I tried those runs at super high speed. By doing this, I'm deliberately making myself aware of my own progress. And that's principle four. There's a saying in the fitness community that today's workout will soon be your warm up. Well, I've just shown myself proof that I'm headed in that direction. 
What was once difficult is now a little less so. In a few more days, 140 uh, will feel like slow motion and my comfort zone will just keep working up. Second, by pushing myself past my limit, I've learned that my technique is gonna have to change in order to play this passage at higher speeds. Naturally, when I first memorized these notes, uh, my touch was heavy in plotting. I can see now that I'm gonna to have to lighten my touch to even approach performance tempo, uh, which by the way is uh, 200 beats per minute. Experimenting at 150 and 160 BPM, even though it's currently out of my league, sends a message to my brain through my fingers of the ways I need to start adjusting my touch to reach much faster tempos. In a couple of days, all these numbers here will be moved up by 10 beats per minute. And then again, a few days after that. I may hit a few frustrating plateaus before reaching full performance tempo, but I'll have the motivation to trudge through them because I'm seeing the progress. The third thing I learned by going fast enough to crash is that I've got a problem with the first part of that second run that wasn't a pair at slower tempos. I'm getting what I guess I'd call interference in my left hand from something that my right hand is doing. Uh, all that's required of my left hand during these runs is octave eighth notes, and that should be uh, on autopilot for someone with my level of experience. Yet when I play this segment of the second run, at higher speeds, I feel a tug in my forearm that's trying to make me bring down my thumb twice instead of toggling to my pinky finger. I can only assume that some other piece of music that I learned in the past called for that hand motion when my right hand was doing something similar to this run. And now the two commands are conflicting with my muscle memory. Regardless of the cause, I now know that I need to isolate that segment and work on it repeatedly at lower speed in order to retrain my hands and brain. Another good metronome challenge is to go in the other direction. Cut your comfort zone speed in half and play the same segment as expressively as possible at that speed. It's shocking how challenging that can be. Those notes fade out and you have to force yourself to wait for the next beat. But this is super useful in truly memorizing the piece rather than relying entirely on muscle memory. That's what's gonna get you out of jams when you're in front of an audience, nervous, and thinking too hard about what you're doing just to let your fingers fly. I can't prove this, but I also believe intuitively that slow practice is sending stronger signals to your brain that this is something you want to chew on even between practice sessions. Now I'm sorry to spend so much time here on step three, but another great way to gamify your practice is the blindfold challenge. When I do this, I don't actually bother with a blindfold, but I'll frequently play through certain passages with my eyes closed, especially passages that require my hands to be far apart or to be so far apart that I can't see them at the same time. So here's a little segment of a different Billy Joel song uh, in which the hands are very far apart. And this is a good one to practice uh, blindfolded. And it goes very, very badly, which is, can be a lot of fun. But the thing is to just keep doing it. It'll go a little less badly each time. So prepare for a train wreck. I'm doing this with my eyes closed. Again. <laughs> so yeah, that didn't go very well, but as a practice tool, it's excellent. Every time I do that, I'll get a little bit better, a little bit better until finally I'm able to play it with, with my eyes closed. And that will transfer to pretty much anything else I play. There are a lot of other good reasons to do a blindfold challenge. One is that in a lot of live performance venues, the bright lights that make you visible to the audience can sometimes cast your hands in complete darkness. Another reason to do it is that audiences like to connect emotionally with performers, and that's hard for them to do if you don't look up every now and then. The absolute best reason though, for practicing with your eyes closed is that it will help you to embody your instrument. Some people call this body mapping, and it's where you feel as if the instrument is physically a part of you, something that you can control with your thoughts, just like your arm. That may sound far-fetched at first, but think of all the other things that you can already do without looking. Got a game console? When was the last time you had to look down at your controller in order to disembowel your enemy? Do you have to take your eyes off the road to operate a car's turn signals, windshield wipers, headlights? God, I hope not. 
To this day, I can type on a QWERTY keyboard without even looking at it because a high school teacher made me do it that way for just one semester. So don't try to tell me that you'll never be able to play your instrument without looking. Now I'll grant you that it takes a lot of practice to get there, but if you think it's impossible, let me know and I'll forward your complaint to Stevie Wonder and Jose Feliciano. I'm sure they'll care about your pansy ass problems. Understand that playing blindfolded isn't the only thing you need to do to become one with your instrument, but it's an essential ingredient. So get started on it. So step four is stitching together all the individual pieces that you've been working on in isolation. This is so that you don't feel the urge to stop at the end of each section. As far as these piano runs go, I've already done that. I learned each hand separately, and then I learned each of the two runs separately. They're similar, but they're not identical. Once I'm playing these runs closer to Billy's live performance speed, I'll start working on the next segment of the song, which is the Brenda and Eddie section. Brenda and Eddie were the popular steadies and the king and the queen of the prom. That one. I'm not going to bore you now with the full demonstration, but once I've got that under control, I'll start to work on moving seamlessly from the fast runs uh, into the Brenda and Eddie section. Before I go on to any other sections, though, I'm going to take a moment to reward myself just for completing those piano runs. That's step five. For God's sake, don't wait until you've mastered the entire piece of music to give yourself a bonus. Every time you level up, you should celebrate. Once I get these runs up to around 180 beats per minute, plenty fast for me. I'm going to reward myself by having a beer, buying a new set of guitar strings, and stealing a baby grand piano. And then I'm going to get to work on another piece of music, one that I've loved since I was a kid, but that's currently above my level of ability. You know the one. Okay, I know I said I was going to show you some examples on the guitar, but this video is already running long, so that's going to have to wait for another time. Before you go, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of my upcoming masterpieces. And would it hurt you to click on the like button and maybe leave a nice comment? Come on, give me that dopamine hit.